Good evening, I'm Jeff Herbsborn, one of the pastors alongside Adam Carnell and with Deacon Kathleen Cartledge. We're your roster leaders here at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Aiken, South Carolina. It's a joy to share in worship with you this evening. Uh, Pastor Adam has a word about the word, and then Deacon Kathleen has uh, some notes about our music today. Yes, today we will look together at what it means for Jesus's authority in the place of the temple that was the center of the social, economic, and religious life of his day, and what he looks like when he claims his authority now in a time like this as well. And tonight we will also have some music that will reflect different aspects of our life. We will hear our handbells from one of their handbell retreats a couple of years ago, and we will sing a more recently written hymn as well as an old familiar him to praise the Lord and recognize his authority and his love in our lives. In our prayers today, we'll lift up the world that we know stands very much in need. And so with that, as we prepare our hearts through our prelude, we invite you simply to pray for those uh, who are most near and dear to you in the world uh, that so needs Christ's presence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We confess our sin in the presence of God and in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, both near and far. Together, 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and our failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. A reading from the 18th chapter of Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart, and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second chapter chapter of Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as, of God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. 
He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? He said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of our Lord. At this time, I invite our children to listen up for our children's message. Do any of you ever have chores to do? When I was growing up, I often had chores to do. My sister and I, when we were growing up, had a list of chores. Now, somehow, I always thought that her chores were easier than mine, and she thought the same thing about me. But we always had a set of chores to do, feed the dog, wash the dishes. But the one I hated was cleaning my room. Now granted, it, it was my room. I should have been the one to clean it. But I would always inevitably get distracted while I was cleaning my room. My mom and my dad would tell me, go clean your room, and I would go up there, and I'd be up there for 15, 20 minutes, an hour, two hours, something like that. And I was there cleaning, or supposedly cleaning, and then I'd look at my clock and realize that I had something much more important to do, like go outside or play video games or something like that, so I would just throw everything into the closet and let it go. Now granted, my parents knew that I was just throwing things in the closet and hoping that when they opened it, the avalanche of things didn't come out on them. But the truth is, I had told them that I was going to clean my room, and I hadn't done it. I hadn't finished my chores. In our gospel lesson, we just heard a parable that Jesus told some of the religious leaders of his day, some of the religious authorities. He talked about a vineyard and two sons. Now, I personally never had the chore of having to go work out in the vineyard. Not sure if ever any of y'all have ever gone and worked out in a vineyard, but this was not easy work. These weren't easy chores, just like cleaning your room up. These took long and time-consuming hours, and the first son that the father went to, that he said, no, I'm not going to do that. But then he, he, he heard that little voice beside him that said, yeah, yeah, you probably should. That voice that when I would ask my parents if I could go do something, they would go, what do you think? 
I don't know what you, what, what do you mean, what do I think? So then again, uh, I would go and probably inevitably make the right decision, hopefully, about what I was supposed to go do, just like this first son. He made the right decision to go into the vineyard and do as his father had asked him. Now, the second son did what I tended to do, and so, yeah, I'll go do that. I'll clean my room, no problem. And then he decided, yeah, it's not quite as important as I had made it out to be. I'm going to just let that one go. And Jesus asked the religious leaders, what do you think? What do you think? It was an important question for them. You see, these people were supposed to be the ones that had the answers. They were supposed to be the religious leaders, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the Jewish people. They knew what God's Word said. Yet Jesus was highlighting how important it is to do God's will, to serve other people, to love other people as a recognition that authority is not about human authority. It's not about being the top dog, being the the best, most brightest, the smartest person, but it's about living in the way that God would have you live. Loving other people, everyone that you meet, recognizing God in the work of them. So I invite you this week especially to pay attention, to see Christ in others, to see the face of Christ as you are serving them, as you're figuring out ways, whether you're in school physically, or you're in school at home, or you're behind a computer screen, to figure out a way to share God's love. Maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's a text message, maybe it's a a message to an email, maybe it's a handwritten message a handwritten message to somebody in our congregation, maybe those that can't physically get out of their house right now. I think they might enjoy a handwritten message, a message of God's love and God's peace to them during this difficult time. So I invite us all to think about that this week, ways that you can serve others, even in a time like this. So when Jesus asked, which one of you did the will of the Father? You can all say with very clear consciences, without hearing that little person telling you you have to, I've gone, sir, and I did. I've done the will of God because each and every one of you is filled, filled with God's love. May you share that with all that you meet. Will you pray with me? Hey, God, sometimes we say yes and we really mean no. Sometimes we say no, and then you keep working in us and through us for yes. Help us to say yes to those things which you are calling us to do and to actually follow through them so that we can share your love with everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I lied. We all lied. Or at least most of us did. I can almost pinpoint the exact moment in time in which each and every one of us awake lied. That time was 12 a.m. January 1st, 2020. Each and every one of us screamed at the top of our lungs, Happy New Year! So certain that it wasn't even just a wish, but a promise that this year, 2020, would be a year to remember. Well, maybe that part did come true. But it seems like a lifetime ago, when we had all those hopes and dreams, so many questions that you never thought you'd have to answer before then. Just, just take your mind back. Questions like, Are you even allowed to quit the royal family? How do I make my own hand sanitizer? What are some efficient alternatives to toilet paper? Can a bandana be worn as a medical mask? How can I cut my hair myself? And the ever-popular one now, 
Am I unmuted? Can you hear? I'm sorry, you couldn't hear. Can you hear me? There's no doubt about it. Our world has changed and changed quickly. Change can be scary. There's a lot to fear right now. The tenor that comes along every four years or so in a presidential election has been raised to a fever pitch that seems higher than ever. The death of a Supreme Court justice has only served to heighten tensions as power grabs seem to be the ultimate goal rather than service or love of neighbor and country. People around this country and the world are seeking answers to a virus that's only been known somewhere around nine to ten months now. When you turn on the news or scroll through it on your phone or iPad, it seems that violence, anger, animosity, and lusting for power are the only things we'll see. Perhaps that's what's become normal these days. But what is normal when it relates to power and authority? Especially what is normal in a year like 2020? A story came up this past week again from a few years ago. I first read it about the late Justice, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia when he died. You see, Justice Scalia was a stalwart of the more conservative Supreme Court justices, while his counterpart, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was a giant among the more liberal Supreme Court justices. Ideologically, they were polar opposites, or at least they seemed to be. On many of their decisions, they vigorously disagreed based upon their own understandings of the Constitution and United States law. Yet despite all of that, the two had a deep and abiding friendship that extended to their spouses. Each New Year, they would dine together enjoying a nice bottle of wine while they listened to opera music. Now, That's not exactly my idea of a good, rousing New Year's Eve, but it sounds like it was theirs. They've been known to travel together along with their family. They were, as Justice Scalia himself claimed, the odd couple. Odd because despite their different opinions, they shared a deep friendship and even a sort of admiration and love for one another. It's said that when President Bill Clinton was deciding on a Supreme Court nominee in 1993, he asked Justice Scalia, if you were stranded on a desert island with your new court colleague, whom would you prefer, Larry Tribe or Mario Cuomo? Two judges that President Clinton were considering then. Scalia looked at him and answered, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In fact, the two were so kind to one another that despite their disagreements, they received a civility award. But I think what they had was, was much deeper than civility. It was much deeper than just an agree-to-disagree mentality. They knew how to live together, to love one another, while both firmly standing on their own convictions. They disagreed with passion, but also with respect with courtesy and a touch of humor. You see, these people understood authority, and they lived into their own authority while loving one another. But it seems like these days the loudest voices are the ones that get the headlines. Those looking to maintain power simply for the sake of power, it's a fundamental question about authority. But as we discovered in our gospel lesson, questions about authority aren't anything new. In our gospel lesson, Jesus tangles with some of those authorities of his day. It says, when Jesus entered into the temple, is how our gospel lesson began. You see, the temple was the seat of all authority, of religious authority, economic and civil life for the Jewish people. Some of the chief priests then, oh, those in authority and the elders of the people, came to Jesus as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave this to you? 
What are more, like, who allows you to do this? Who do you think you are? You see, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus has been answering that question throughout the whole time, shaking up authority from the very beginning of his ministry. Beginning in the north of the country in Galilee, he's now made it down to Jerusalem. As we discussed earlier, that very seat of all authority. The elders and the chief priests began to find a way to make sure that Jesus knew who was in charge, who had the power to find a way to trap him. They ask Jesus, so why are you doing these things? Who gives you that authority? So Jesus turns it back around on them and says, I'm also going to ask you a question. If you tell me the answer, then I'll tell you whose authority I do these things. Did John's baptism come from heaven or is it human? Well, you could almost hear the chief priests mulling through it in their head because they were realizing if, if we say it's from heaven, then he'll say, well, then why didn't you listen to him? But if we say it's only human, the, the crowd, they'll turn on us. They were afraid of them because they all believe John's a prophet. So they turned and gave Jesus that answer that I probably gave my parents multiple times and I probably many of you have to yourselves. Why did you do this? I don't know. Jesus turns back to him. So I won't tell you why I do these things either. I won't tell you why I have this authority. Because it's not from human hands. It's not the kind of authority, the kind of power that you wield with. You knew the right way to do things. You've been studying this whole God stuff for a while. And if you still don't know what it means, I'm not just going to tell you the answer. Let's let you figure it out. What do you think? He then tells that story, a parable. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, go and work in the vineyard. He said no, but later changed his mind and went anyway. Father went to the second and he said, yeah, I can do that. But he didn't go. Now, which one did his father's will? Well, Jesus... I've been studying this whole God thing for a while, as you noted earlier, but that one's an easy one. That question's not hard at all. It's the first. That's right, Jesus said. And that means the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Whoa. Say that again, Jesus. Tax collectors? Prostitutes? They don't know anything about the kingdom of God. We're the ones that have all the answers. We're the ones that have all the authority. They're the ones you think are going ahead of us? Talk about throwing down authority. Jesus was changing the very way the Jewish people understood God, shaking things up, answering the question about ultimate authority, ultimate power. It's God. It's the same God that today comes to us in baptism. God that is revealed to us in the face of each and every human being. The God that points out that what unites us is far, far deeper than what divides us. The God that reminds us, even in the midst of this pandemic, that God is living and active. Maybe your prayer, maybe your prayer for these past couple of months has been that we will just go back to like it was on January 1st, 2020, full of hope and prayers and wishes that this would be a happy new year. Maybe that's your hope for 2021. But if what if? What if we're learning something profound from all of this? Even in the midst of disagreements, of anger and animosity. It's not about looking for power. It's about looking for love. Maybe in the midst of this, maybe we love a little more. May we treasure the ability to look into one another's eyes from across a dinner table less than six feet away a bit more deeply than we did the last time it happened. And may we never lose the lessons from this experience. May we recognize the face of Christ 
in the eyes of each and every person that we meet. Thanks be to God. Amen. We now confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Lord, in your mercy. Your son took on a bodily life in our world, even to death. Preserve and keep your creation, O God. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged so that all of creation confesses you as Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Turn the nations toward life. Where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our cultures and institutions, change our minds and teach us to trust your authority, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected, hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Be especially present to the persons, situations, or circumstances we bring before you now, either upon our lips or within our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, continue to turn us from our own interests toward the interests of others in our community. Fill us with your compassion and sympathy Bless ministries of care in our community, especially the Mended Hearts, Stephen Ministry, and Parkinson's Support Group. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for those who have gone into the kingdom ahead of us. Tax collectors and prostitutes, likely and unlikely, obedient and slow to learn. Hear the names of all who now rest in your eternal grace and goodness as we speak them either upon our lips or within our hearts. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The sharing of the peace is more than a simple good morning or a hello, how are you? It is the very peace of our risen Lord that we wish upon one another and our world at this time. Following our response, we invite you to pause this service video and share the peace of the risen Christ with those around you. If you feel alone or are lonely, please know again that we are with you in heart and spirit. So now let us raise our hands in the air and wish peace upon one another. The peace of the risen Christ be with you. We now turn our hearts to our offering. We recognize that offering is more than monetary support. Yet without your monetary support, our ministry would not be as vibrant as we know it to be. So we want to thank you for your generosity, for your love and commitment to the ministry and mission in which we share. Even though we've not been able to pass an offering plate, many of you have found the mailbox or your computer to be your nearest offering plate. 
And so we thank you for using the online giving button or contributing by mail. We encourage you to fill out your estimate of giving cards for 2021 and bring those by the church next week, next Sunday. Either drive them through on Sunday morning. You'll find details in our epistle. Our stewardship team will be there to greet you and give you an ice cream sandwich to boot. They're working very hard to do all they can to make this fun for you in the very anxious times in which we live. We can do more together than any of us can do apart. And so again, we thank you and we ask you to reflect upon not only your monetary gift, but all your spiritual gifts that God has so graciously given you to use in this world which stands so in need of the light that is you. We pray, God of all goodness and grace, receive the gifts of our hearts, our lives, our spirits that we offer before you at this time, and grant that our whole life may give you glory and praise through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. 
And now, and now let us pray as our Savior has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. It was a joy to share in worship with you this evening. We're so thankful that you continue to connect in this way to the mission and ministry of St. Paul. Many of you continue to serve at Acts and have helped in the highway cleanup and have found ways to share Jesus' love and serve, and we're so thankful for that. 221 persons have been able to attend one of our Zone Communions. Many of you attended the Zone Communion today. We're thankful for our Eucharistic ministers and Zone managers and all who have made that possible. We're getting ready to uh, present to you an opportunity in October to come one of two Sundays, either the first or third Sunday in October, on site. We're limiting the space to manage our space safely, and so we'll hope, we hope that you uh, take advantage of that. If you're at that place where many of you are not quite at that place, it's okay. And our zone communions continue for that reason. Uh, they provide that safe place where you can receive the sacrament and be in community with one another. We will meet, the three of us will meet with Helen Reynolds tomorrow in our Colibarium uh, to have a farewell and Godspeed prayer with her. She will be moving uh, closer to her family. So we want you to know that. We'll include her new address in the epistle so that you might can send a card. Now, Pastor Adam and Deacon Kathleen have a couple of words, and then we'll continue with our benediction. Yes, one of those many ministry opportunities that you have uh, so graciously loved these past few years is our blessing of the animals, and we were proud to say that it will continue. It will certainly look different this year. It will be all outside. There will be masks worn. Uh, we ask that you bring your own chair so that we can distance safely from one another, and with our... Uh, furry or scaly or slimy friends. So we ask that you also contact Kathy Starkey, look in your epistle for more information about it. It will be October 3rd at 10 a.m. Thank you. Deacon Kathleen, you have a word about the significance of the day. You're going to send people on a Google search, but also if you would share with people uh, some of what you've been doing with our Zoom groups. I think they'd be interested to know that our, our choirs are continuing to, to uh, live out their ministry. Yes, I want you to be, feel invited to search on Google for Vincent DePaul. Uh, we remember him as a renewer of the church this day from 1660. And I have continued to uh, meet with as many music groups as possible by Zoom. Uh, Chris Morgan's been meeting with the 945 musicians as well, he, he and Donna Derrick. But um, what I've been doing with the choirs is we've been working to rehearse, for them to rehearse at home to send in audio recordings soon so that we can try and mix them. If this works, you will hear the results in worship online. And this is also a way for them to prepare for the time when they come back into the space to sing. The bell ringers are also working at home. They've been broken up into quartets. And this week they're receiving music <clears throat> so they can rehearse at home with wooden spoons until the time comes that they can gather in the space safely to ring in worship. Lots of work going on behind the scenes, and we thank you for that. We thank you for staying connected and shepherding those uh, members who serve in the music ministry of St. Paul. We thank those members for continuing to stay connected. And if you are watching and you're sharing in worship, uh, we really would encourage you uh, to, to connect in some way uh, in a Zoom group or uh, the Zoom communions, but stay connected. Uh, it's important in this time. Uh, you may not feel that you particularly need it, um, but somebody might need you. And so we would encourage you uh, to think in that respect, because there are many people who need your spirit, your prayers, and the gifts that God has placed within you. So now may God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
in peace. Share the good news. Hallelujah.